And uh, good morning, Brian. How are you doing? Good morning, Rich. Doing well. Oh, great! Great to have you on the call. Good to see you again. Well, so we're we're just coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. As always, uh, you know, we tend to have folks that sort of get on the call just a little bit late. I do want to get uh, uh, get started and kick off uh, right away. We have, a, I think, what I imagine is going to be a pretty full agenda today. Uh, well, first of all, uh, as always, welcome uh, to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. Uh, this is sponsored through the Linux Foundation. And uh, as a reminder, uh, we, we always record the, these events uh, for future reference. Uh, and so keep that in mind as you, uh, as you engage in, in this next hour. Uh, as well, we have an antitrust slide as part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, it's up on your screen now. Please feel free to review that. Uh, and there's a URL for detailed information about the antitrust policy. Uh, in short, it just means please be a good person. Uh, and so really with that said, uh, let's, let's sort of kick things off with introductions. I, I suspect folks will get on the, on the call a little, a little bit, but uh, we do have Guillermo. He's, he's fairly new and he did a great presentation to the healthcare inter interoperability subgroup uh, about a week ago. Uh, Guillermo, do you want to do uh, just introduce yourself to the to the group here? Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, as as Rich mentioned, I'm 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 new in this uh, group, and I'm just learning a lot since I just joined. Uh, my name is Guillermo Diaz. I have a, a startup here in Mexico, which have a representation of. Uh, electronic health record uh, company from California and we have a challenge here because uh, well, I also participated in an organization in Mexico an IT organization that it's the the IT technology group where participate almost all the uh, companies who has presence in Mexico like IBM Amazon Google, etc. So uh, there is an initiative from the federal government that uh, he wanted to to uh, see if we, as a group, uh, we can figure out how we can create an interoperability project to connect almost all the public and private hospitals in the region. So basically what I did uh, yesterday was a brief presentation. I mean, I mean the, the last uh, week was a brief presentation about uh, my own uh, high level solution. And I just put it into the group just to see with the experts if uh, this uh, schema will work or not and you know, learn about the experts, how to craft a better solution for us. So this is basically what I did and thank you for the invitation. It's, it's great to have uh, all the experts here and know that uh, this group is uh, working to, to create a, a better understanding about blockchain and all the benefits on that in healthcare. Excellent. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, and, and so, sort of, what specifically are you focused on using using blockchain? Oh, yeah, that that's a good question. And and actually, this is something that uh, we have been discussing locally, because some of the companies that participate they think that blockchain is not necessary. In my case, or in my own uh, perspective. I believe that I would like to use into the uh, protection of the data, the validation of the uh, um, interactions with other systems, and uh, you know, as a key factor to to the privacy and all the things that uh, we have to protect here by law and by you know the the, the international. Uh, processes and procedures that the the health system has 
uh, to comply. Oh, excellent. Outstanding. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for your involvement uh, in the healthcare interoperability subgroup. Uh, very much appreciated and, and great to have you joining the group here. Uh, I, I imagine there's going to be some, uh, some really interesting work coming uh, out of that subgroup, particularly as, as uh, Stephen ramps up and, and engages folks like yourself uh, to really drive some very interesting ideas forward uh, within uh, respective communities. So th thank you. I appreciate that. Tremendous. Thank you, Rich. Take care. Um, anyone else want to volunteer? Uh, introduce themselves if you're fairly new uh, to the to the group. Ah, uh, we have a couple of shy folks. So uh, I see uh, Jonathan on the call. I don't recognize you, your name offhand. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so I've actually been lurking for the last uh, year or two. So okay. Jonathan Holt, so I'm the founder of Transcendex. I'm a physician, a geneticist, but mostly do informatics and um, blockchain applications. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on this call every now and then. Yeah, okay. Yeah, your, na your, your voice sounds very familiar. Uh, where, whereabouts are you located? I'm all over, but mostly my companies are based in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I live in Chicago, and um, I travel quite a bit. Outstanding. Very cool. Uh, any specific uh, projects that you're working on that are blockchain related? Yeah, so I mentioned last week, I was on the call last week when Erica was um, hosting, and I mentioned that I'm the uh, chair of the IEEE um, Identity in, in Healthcare subgroup of the P2418.6. Uh, oh, standard. right, right, right. Yeah, I, I remember reviewing the notes. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, very so, cool. And uh, we're working on um, immunization records and uh, using uh, DID, so the decentralized identifiers uh, specification. And so I'm working mostly with um, Sovereign and uh, Indy to actually, or at least one of the, uh, someone who's using Indy to actually work out some of the interoperability, mostly about the semantics of what is an immunization record. Um, some of the challenges are also um, what information belongs in that verifiable credential and what doesn't. So the concern, uh, we initially modeled it using uh, fire resources as the evidence and um, that might leak too much information. And so we're trying to whittle it down to what's the bare minimum necessity for a verifiable credential. And the, it's cert certainly apropos given the coronavirus um, outbreak uh, that the imagine there is there will be a vaccination hopefully uh, for coronavirus um, in the future and imagine it being really a, a credential for freedom of travel so if you're stuck in china or in japan or trying to get home and you're being blocked um, you just like you have the yellow card the uh, who yellow card for international travel mostly for places like africa where you actually need to have a documentation of a yellow fever vaccination that this also will actually be more uh, enabling freedom of travel in healthcare. And then, as I mentioned before, the immunization records are sort of like the hello world of EHRs. Um, I'm back when I used to teach at uh, Vanderbilt, the, um, I teach the students about you know writing a, uh, creating an EHR is always starting with immunization records because there's actually a lot there with um, time just time stamping um, signatures, uh, codified representation of the vaccination record. Even just like the, the, should we use the CDC standard? That's actually like the, the big uh, question right now. The CDC has the most comprehensive code of vaccination records, but is that universally adopted across the world? So we think in the United States, it's the de facto standard, but maybe some places else it actually does, doesn't want to use that code system. So again, it goes back to semantics as being the first interoperability piece. Yeah, and it's really interesting because semantics is, is actually very difficult to, to solve for. Uh, Stephen, uh, who leads our uh, healthcare interoperability subgroup, has an interest in uh, semantic interoperability, which is uh, significantly more difficult to sort of solve for than syntactic interoperability. And so you can imagine uh, very quickly things get complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mostly the verifiable credential working group is using JSON-LD, uh, JSON-linked data, which is actually a spe specification comes out of W3C. Unfortunately, it relies on uh, Web 2.0 technology, so the HTTP protocol, which is totally vulnerable to uh, man in the middle attacks. So if you right. were using it for a credential, especially a security credential, um, and we've already demoed this as far as a man in the middle SSL proxy um, that it's just it's um, is a big issue of, of security vulnerabilities, and so we're trying to harden those as well. 
uh, something like tunneling, uh, some sort of uh, encryption of some sort? To, uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, the, I'm in, intrigued by the, the DID communication protocol and coming out of uh, my right. theories. And yeah, so that yeah. is you basically you can do um, HTTP over DIDCOM. And uh, certainly where you do the, the Diffie-Hillman key exchange with or did authentication, and then you actually have a secure end to end. We're actually like, it's hard because we're reinventing all these technologies um, in, and but we're sometimes wrapping that in HTTP. So I hate when companies say, oh, we're doing blockchain. It's in, it's in on Azure and it's, uh, you know, we're, we're basically leveraging it, but it's basically you're calling an API and that API is to totally vulnerable to interception, interception. So it's, um, we're trying to truly be, uh, at least my company is truly trying to be truly offline first um, and not reliant on, on the HTTP protocol. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you're, you're basically redeveloping a new protocol stack that has to be secure from the bottom up. So, yeah. So, uh, just, so you also mentioned uh, the use of Fire. What's the context again for using Fire? So HL7 Fire is, uh, so when you're encoding the evidence for a vaccination record, um, you, can, you can do it like a piece of paper or a PDF or an image of the vaccination. But uh, the JSON schema for immunization record is actually pretty um, uh, solid. Um, the challenge with, I, I was involved with FHIR for a number of years, um, is that there's a million different ways to represent something. So you need to have a way that is deterministic to actually like, you know, you, you have those ideally one way of encoding it and that's it. But um, FHIR allows you to be very uh, robust in your uh, characterization of many different things, which makes it challenging to interpret. Oh, interesting. So, so I, I think what I what I had heard that it, the SSI solution you're developing is using uh, effectively Fire as maybe the the protocol or uh, the, the the. So no, no, just to the JSON schema. So the JSON schema representing a, an object. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Oh, very cool. Um, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, great to have you on the call again. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the stuff that we do, uh, I'm doing some work right now with Providence Health uh, up here in the Seattle area, and uh, we're, we're very much invested in uh, sort of next generation interoperability. Um, uh, and and uh, the team that I work with does, uh, does develop blockchain uh, backend solutions, but we're finding that to mm -hmm. engage with our payers, it's all about interoperability. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting. Yeah, and I think uh, it's also challenging, uh, as I was involved in FHIR for a number of years, and so I spent three years on the clinical genomics working group, and uh, my wife just implemented a, a genomics integration into her EHR at her work. And, uh, and I said, oh, this is great. That's what I worked on. I spent three years doing it. And they actually did uh, version 2.5 of, uh, of HL7, not the FHIR uh, RESTful API. Yeah, the, the, full, the full HL7. Yeah, the, the yeah, sort so of the, predecessor of FHIR. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Oh, very cool. Uh, great to have you on the call again. Appreciate it. Uh, anyone else on the call want to introduce themselves? Uh, Jim Mason with Paramount Software, and we do a variety of different blockchain solutions for clients. And I was just interested in tracking the conversation Jonathan had about, um, in a sense, schemas and uh, for vaccinations and so on. And, and there's some architectural things that kind of work. So one, you guys already hit the idea that um, for getting HTTP, there's plenty of existing protocols um, that you can use uh, that are not difficult to dynamically connect using SSL keys in effect, and then wind up, as you mentioned, with some sort of a tunneling uh, service in a sense that is, um, I'll call it well protected uh, over the internet. But the other thing is this notion of schemas. Um, so as a data architect, I do a lot of work on schema stuff. And what we find two things, one is that um, the concept of a base schema um, that's common and standard across you know, whatever the different domains are works fine. But then you, there's no reason not to allow what I call schema extensions. So, you know, the example you're talking about, um, I'm, I'm making the, I'll call it the use case up here, but the idea of travel saying that there's a vaccination as a verification, if you will, off my DID and that there would be a base schema on that makes sense to me. Um, if the US required a different level of information about that vaccination, that would just be an extension. And so when you look at a DID, if I own the DID, I control a sense what I share. And so I would say, okay, here's my, in the case of something like vaccinations, here's the base, um, in a sense, uh, verification that I'll make available to everybody. 
But in the case of the U.S., I might allow additional information about that vaccination easily. Um, so it's, I don't think it's hard to model that stuff is what I would argue. Um, it's pretty easy to do those kind of things. Because they're being done actually right now on blockchain in other domains. So things like supply chain is actually doing that where they have, in a sense, customized um, I'll call it point to point extensions to a core schema. So, you know, if you're a supplier um, to me, I can require additional information beyond the base schema. And that's just an extension that's unique between you and I. And nobody else gets to know that information, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the notion of uh, of extensions in in a schema is pretty pretty typical. If uh, so, so in in the fire world, there's something called smart on fire, and one way to to sort of override some of the things uh, that that exist in sort of that bare bones schema is is something uh, in the in the JSON file, which is property called uh, extension. So you can pretty much do whatever you want through that. And the only other thing I'll argue is there's a the concept of metadata mapping with synonyms. So you mentioned in the case of fire or whatever. That we there's some complexity, I guess, around identifying, um, I'll call it data elements in the schema differently from for interoperability use cases. And so for things like that on the data side, we've always used synonyms, you know, dynamically mapping the synonyms. And then that provided, you know, the mapping onto a different schema. Cool. Very interesting. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, and glad to have you back on the call as well. Uh, all right. Well, anyone else want to introduce themselves before we move on? All righty. Okay. Well, so uh, so I, I do have uh, some some uh, interesting community announcements coming up. Of course, in about a month, uh, the uh, Hyperledger Global Forum is 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 due to happen. Uh, and uh, if you haven't uh, gotten involved, feel free to do so. Uh, it, it is uh, early March, so we're we're coming up on it. Uh, it'll be in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so for those of you that are out of country, it might be a little bit of a, of a travel. Uh, but we do have, which is really great, we do have uh, um, sort of a representative of sorts. Uh, I won't be able to attend, uh, but uh, we do have John Walker, uh, who he's going to be sort of our, our, our proxy for the HC SIG. Uh, at, at the, they're developing out a, a kiosk area for all SIGs, and so he'll be representing us at that, at that kiosk. And uh, I, I also understand, and, and Dennis, I think maybe you can weigh in with a, additional information on this. Uh, John will be doing a, a short video presentation on our behalf as well. Uh, Dennis, was there anything more that you wanted to add to that? I know you were in, uh, involved in that sort of thread of conversation with uh, Hyperledger leadership folk. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rich. The, 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 the attendance of uh, John is mainly uh, representing our healthcare group, but uh, we will also uh, make uh, the presentation of our uh, POC uh, consent part in the clinical trials. So he will be also uh, hopefully uh, able to uh, not only uh, presenting the soft version, and I hope uh, he will also make the presentation of the fabric. This will be also a great lessons learned for the folks uh, attending to the uh, global forum. And uh, as you said, we want to also prepare a, a short video about our uh, activities, about our objectives and uh, the, the, the products we are working on. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, well, well, it's great to have John uh, participate and, and represent us. Uh, outstanding uh, to have him sort of step up and, and be a part of that. Uh, I really look forward to, to having anyone uh, who's participating in that forum to maybe uh, come back with us with a sort of a, a conference report. Uh, is anyone on the call uh, going to be attending that? Yeah. yeah um, Rich, Rich, this is Ravish. I Ravish. am going to be attending that. I'm already registered. So oh, excellent. I'll be there. Oh, well, good. Uh, you could work with John then uh, at, the, uh, at the SIG kiosk, perhaps, uh, and, uh, and help to represent the, the, the uh, HC SIG. Excellent. Uh, was there someone else on the call that's also going to be in attendance? Yeah, Jim Mason. I'll be there. Oh, good. All right. Great. To, good, good to have you, Jim. I would suggest, uh, yeah, at some point you find a way to maybe uh, rendezvous with, uh, with John as well. Uh, and Ravish, and, and that'll be a great opportunity for, uh, for you to uh, meet physically and, uh, and get to know one another. 
And and again, one of the one of the nice things would be to have uh, sort of at the back of your mind, keep your eyes and, and ears open for anything interesting that you think might be might be of value to uh, to the group as a whole, uh, as as it relates to something in health in the healthcare space that you sort of encounter at the uh, at the global forum. That would be that would be great to do. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so as well, we have the uh, the Hims conference uh, coming up, uh, also uh, sort of beginning of April, uh, April uh, March, uh, and that's uh, really effectively just one week after the Global Forum. Uh, and so uh, again, uh, if you're interested in participating, uh, I'm sure you, you probably want to be queued for that already. It's it's already kind of late in the cycle for that. What's really uh, going to be great is that uh, we are again planning a social event uh, for the HC Sig. Uh, I am planning to attend, uh, and the only uh, caveat that we really have is uh, has more to do with uh, the coronavirus, unfortunately. Uh, but the plan going forward is that I'll be in attendance as well as Brian Bellendorf. Uh, and I, I think most people probably know Brian is the executive director uh, for Hyperledger. Uh, I, what most people maybe don't know is that Brian also has, uh, a, in his sort of a, a background, uh, he did some work in the healthcare uh, space. So he's going to be uh, joining us at the HIMSS conference again this year, and he'll be uh, speaking um, uh, at uh, Providence booth uh, that I'll be involved with, uh, as well as the social event that's happening on, uh, on that Tuesday, uh, sort of after most of the presentations uh, have come and gone. It's Tuesday uh, afternoon from four to five. Uh, that's Eastern time. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you do need to sign up for that. Uh, here's the registration through Eventbrite. Uh, it's it's free to attend if you're going to be joining us, uh, but uh, feel free to, to sort of sign up uh, in advance. I think we are limited to, I, I think, about 20 people or so. Uh, for folks that were in attendance uh, for of, of the HIMSS conference last year, this is very similar to what we did last year. Uh, where a number of us, uh, gosh, I want to say maybe about a dozen or so folks, uh, maybe a bit more, got together. Uh, <laughs> I think Dennis, Dennis might recall we sat out on a veranda uh, in, now this, recall this is in Orlando, Florida, uh, which tends to be uh, generally rather hot and, and humid. Uh, it's, it's tropical or certainly subtropical. Uh, and it was very cold. <laughs> so uh, Dennis, do you recall uh, the, the chill in the air? Uh, very much, but it was a great event, Rich. Yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed it. It was a great networking, getting to to each other and also exchanging uh, ideas, experiences. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. And maybe I can also join this year. It's not clear now. Uh, tomorrow will be the milestone for me. I'm going to decide and let you know. Oh, good. Okay. Well, my fingers are crossed. I, I'm, I'm hopeful to have you join us again. Uh, it was great to meet and work with you last year. So fingers crossed. Uh, anyone else on the call uh, planning to attend the HIMSS conference? Okay. Well, so uh, I'll hold the, the same, uh, uh, same sort of uh, um, uh, sort of level up, which is I will report back on anything of, of interest. Uh, that comes out of the conference. As I think uh, many people know, uh, last year's conference, what we really sort of took from that was uh, membership um, uh, got some very good direction from uh, conference attendees as it relates to sort of where where we got a sense for where uh, attendees, and of course attendees are healthcare professionals that tend to have IT sort of backgrounds or they tend to be C-suite folk. Uh, we got a good sense for where their understanding of blockchain te te technologies were, you know, about one year ago. And uh, some of the feedback that we got was uh, they want to understand governance of blockchain solutions, uh, which is really good to understand because it, it had less, we, I had uh, certainly fewer questions that related to uh, what blockchain is. Uh, I remember those questions came up uh, about two years ago, uh, maybe three. Uh, and then last year, we also got some good feedback about how uh, we have a real interest in developing use cases uh, to help uh, folks have a better sense for where applicability uh, for blockchain technologies might go to. Uh, and out of that, we developed a, a use case development team that uh, uh, Erica is leading uh, now. And so uh, we'll get to her update momentarily. But uh, I, yeah, I, I'm really interested to see where we sort of uh, go this time around. 
I will speculate that uh, this year we will probably get a better, probably a, a better sense for folks using uh, self-sovereign identity. So SSI, I think, is going to start to mature a bit, uh, and, um, and this is maybe in part in line with what Jonathan has sort of uh, talked about earlier. Uh, but I'm certainly getting a feeling that, uh, it's, uh, particularly in the healthcare space, uh, using SSI and, and DID uh, technologies, uh, I think, is going to be a very easy sort of spin up within the healthcare domain. But we shall see. It'll be very interesting. Okay, so let's move on to uh, our subgroup updates. Uh, for those of you that are new, subgroups are really where a lot of the heavy lifting happens uh, within the uh, HC SIG. Uh, these are very focused uh, teams of folk that are interested in very uh, specific areas uh, in the healthcare area, and they really are driving a lot of the actual work that, that gets done uh, out, of, out of the larger membership here. So we'll, we'll get started with, with Dennis. Uh, Dennis is our, uh, our lead. Uh, he chairs the, the patient uh, member subgroup. Dennis, you want to give us an update? Yeah, thank you, Rich. Um, for the newcomers with attending our call, uh, we, our scope is mainly uh, clinical research and the consent process particularly. Brian uh, had uh, attended our call two weeks ago. We had also a chat. Thanks, Brian, for your inputs. And uh, we are uh, in the uh, phase of uh, POC, development of the POC uh, fabric and sorted for the same use case, for the identical use case. And the soft uh, POC is already prepared. Uh, the next step is the fabric one, and uh, our uh, boat uh, guys, uh, Kent, Kent is also in the call, and uh, John are doing great work. Thank you guys, and uh, I hope we can also have a viable uh, piece of uh, work which we can present in the global forum. And in the meantime, we are also uh, developing the, uh, the, the protocol part of the consent, which is to be integrated uh, in, the, in, the, in the process, in the workflow. And after both of the uh, parts of a clinical trial, the next part is the patient monitoring. This is the roadmap we are uh, we want to have in the next uh, weeks, in the next months, and it is also very much important sharing our information, uh, our experience with different groups, and we decided uh, with the kind invitation of Ravish next week presenting our work in their subgroup after our call. This will be next week, Friday. Uh, nine uh, Pacific time for our subgroup and uh, payers uh, subgroup 10 Pacific time in the same channel. So this is a brief uh, update from our sites. You are very much welcome next week to our subgroup and to the next one payers group for our presentation. Excellent, Dennis. Thank you for that. Uh, again, thank you to, to, to you and the team. Uh, you guys have done a ph phenomenal job uh, moving forward with the, the development of your solutions. So uh, for, for those that are newer on the call, uh, do you want to explain why you're doing a, both a fabric and a sawtooth solution? Uh, this is mainly uh, a uh, lessons learned for the hyperledger uh, community uh, we have uh, actually very um, how can i say uh, we are in the first steps of developing uh, enterprise blockchain with different uh, frameworks and if you have a use case which is also very much supported by erica uh, the the structure and the methodology it's also important the lessons learned, how you how uh, how and what framework you have to choose for different use cases, and this is very much for the uh, objective 
and this is very much our uh, efforts to 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 to, uh, to gain the uh, experience and generate the knowledge and distribute it to different uh, groups in the hyperledger community. This is the main objective. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Dennis. Uh, and and just I interestingly, uh, any have you noticed any? Uh, impediments or roadblocks between using fabric versus sawtooth? Is one easier to develop for than the other? Are there, have you noticed patterns of, of uh, value or um, efficiency? We defined all the uh, evaluation criteria, but it is very much early to talk about uh, the pros and cons uh, or uh, suitable or not being suitable for this and that. And uh, the, the both frameworks, Software and Fabric, are uh, not very much similar. Interesting. Uh, Good. I would like to carefully, carefully put into a sentence. Kent, <laughs> would you like to uh, add to my words? <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. My name's Kent. I'm in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm helping Dennis and his team uh, stand up a proof of concept for on the fabric side and helping Alex on the sawtooth side. So just to answer Rich's question very briefly, there are lots of things that we haven't figured out how to do in sawtooth that we are doing in already in fabric. So for example, in fabric we have channels. How do you go and replicate channels or the, if the, the structure and architect of channels inside sawtooth? That's simply not possible so we are experimenting with different ways as in having different um, maybe uh, replication of the blockchain so having three separate sawtooth blockchains running at the same time to replicate three different channels in the fabric and now we're working on the smart contracts and we're having great difficulty trying to figure out how to do the same things in sawtooth because it works very differently, even though we call them smart contracts, it, it doesn't work like that at all. Right. Uh, yeah, interesting, yeah, that, that would make sense. Well, it would be really interesting. Uh, uh, go, uh, go ahead, Jim, go ahead. I was just saying, Ken, um, which version of Fabric are you working on now? So I'm working on 1.4, and I will be standing up 2.0 fairly soon once we've got the global forum out of the way because 2.0 has some new features regarding the smart contracts. And right. we're hoping to do, to do something I've called uh, multi-hopping. So we're trying to transfer data from one channel to another channel, and that's simply not possible at the moment. So we're hoping to find ways to do that inside the blockchain uh, network rather than calling out the data and then putting it back in, which is uh, maybe insecure in some ways. That, that's a great point because that so that the reason that's exactly why I asked the question because 2.0 now has that external chain code launcher which may be of use and then it also has um, a completely different program model that's a lot simpler so I can just do a submit transaction instead of doing all the you know collect all the approvals and see if I you know met the policy requirements and then submit the transaction so there's some big differences there and I'm just looking at the code side of it uh, from looking at the samples in 2.0, and the code is a lot simpler, you know, than what I did in 1.4 and 1.3. Yes, uh, so smart contracts are critical, really, to what we're doing. So standing up a network is fairly easy and fairly uh, similar to many different projects. However, the uniqueness will be in the, the chain code itself. And uh, like I just mentioned, the difficulty we're facing is transferring data from one channel to another. So uh, I'm not sure whether we can do that yet. Yeah, I haven't tried that. Um, but that external chain code launcher may be a way to do that. I'll call it the Oracle idea. The other thing I'll throw out there is a friend of mine actually has um, got his own um, blockchain platform company, and he's based it on Hyperledger Fabric. And one of the things that he's actually done that's kind of neat, he's just completed, um, he built it originally on the IBM blockchain, which is fine. But what he did is he ran an experiment where he took it off of IBM and replatformed the whole thing and did it on um, Kubernetes and on DigitalOcean. 
And so what he's now got is a way to say, okay, I can connect orgs on any platform um, underneath Kubernetes into his, you know, fabric, uh, you know, network, which is actually pretty nice. So, you know, he no longer has the requirement, like, a, a, I can't believe how many blockchains have that requirement, like, oh, okay, to join our blockchain, yes, we use Sawtooth or whatever it is, but, oh, you have to run on this cloud platform because that's where, in a sense, uh, it's hosted. But in his case, um, he's now running nicely underneath Kubernetes, and so he can literally pull in anybody in the future from any platform, which is um, pretty neat. And it's all, yeah, so that's, you know, that's very interesting. With your fabric. Yeah, that's very interesting because um, part of the benefits of Kubernetes is that you have a uh, you're running a container inside of a container. So you have yes. you're running the chain code inside a Kubernetes container itself. So you already have uh, an extra layer of security. So if we have to hop the data outside of the fabric network, we can mitigate that by keeping it within the Kubernetes container or Kubernetes node, and then. Yes. Uh, at least it doesn't go outside externally. So that's one way to do it. And also figuring out the, the, the data science behind it. So uh, I figured that the data itself needs to be used somewhere else or down the road. So putting it on the blockchain is not the end all and be all. So for people who do data analytics, they'll need to uh, reassemble the data in a separate non couch DB in a, in a usable database system like SQL or non SQL. Correct. Uh, and then, yes. so with Kubernetes, um, we, it's very easy to uh, assemble uh, a separate database to and filter the data uh, one side onto the chain and then another side into a usable analytics database and for other people to use. That's a huge issue. And that's unfortunately not resolved with anybody. <laughs> None of the blockchains. Oh, I, think, I, think, I think we've resolved that because that's quite easy because you can either filter the data before it goes in uh, and then if it's once it's in, uh, we can have filter again within Kafka. So you can say, oh, we want to uh, Kafka to broadcast the data for the fabric chain. Also, we can filter it to a separate uh, database for the analytics. And also, so, luckily, there is already uh, an, analyt an analytics platform called Kubiflow, which is data analytics, analytics uh, for Kubernetes itself. So once you join all the dots together, then theoretically, it's uh, quite doable. Actually, so thanks, because I haven't looked at all at Kubeflow. But what I do know is working with just regular fabric, one of the problems with CouchDB, so we, first of all, you're not going to put, obviously, all the data in most use cases onto the fabric blockchain. But you will have that data available from CouchDB. That's one part of it. But you're going to wind up with, in a sense, off-chain data as well, like you said, that you have to distribute. You can use Kafka or whatever you want to use. Uh, one of the challenges there, of course, is that you're winding up standing up Kafka in the future differently because they're using Raft and 2.0, you know, as the default platform for what it's worth. Um, but you're right; you can, you can distribute the data using something like Kafka uh, to other nodes separately from the blockchain itself. The trick to it is um, what frustrates me is, and you mentioned Kubeflow, which may work for the Kubernetes model, but if I'm not using Kubernetes, I don't have an easy way to get to the data. So what it is is for for the analytics as you point out. So what happens is, yes, I have the data in CouchDB. Yes, I can run queries against CouchDB. No, that's not actually a useful thing to do easily because there's no um, interface that you can get to CouchDB that supports what I call standard analytics tools or SQL reporting tools. And so one of the missing holes for me, and maybe Kubeflow does address it, is this idea that I, you know, if you're a, a quote, a non-technical developer for a fabric blockchain, you should be able to come up and say, hey, I know SQL and I'm authorized and therefore I want to see what's not only on the blockchain, but I also want to see, in a sense, the off-chain data as well, integrated easily with something, any SQL tool of which there's a million out there. And so the missing ingredient for that is that there's no JDBC driver for CouchDB today. And I even looked at using Camel and some other integration things and there's still no, in a sense, way to integrate CouchDB into one of those standardized data sources, which would be nice, but Kubeflow might do that, and that's worth looking at for sure. Thanks. Yeah, one more thing. Sorry to interrupt, Rich. Just one, one more thing in reply to that. Uh, some interesting ideas I've had is using the event broadcast to actually send out the information after it's on the chain. So yes. if, once you've um, you know uh, endorsed everything, and when everyone 
does the committing, then you can actually use event broadcast to send the data out to your external data, well, not external, to another database. And then um, in reply to your second question was, how do you analyze it? Well, um, there's a neat thing called Elasticsearch. So we can actually try and repurpose that for data science, but that's, that's probably for another day. Yeah. Well, excellent. Yes. Yeah. So, so thank, thank you, Ken and, and Jim. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I suspect, uh, Jim, uh, you may want to sort of keep in sync uh, on some of these topics. Uh, they're they're interesting, and and particularly as we move over to to uh, Hyperledger Fabric 2.0, it'll be interesting to see how that gets developed out. Um, well, thanks, Dennis, as well. Uh, let, we'll move on to uh, Ravish. Who Just one remark, uh, Rich. Sure, Jim, sure. you are also very much welcome to our subgroup anytime. Oh, excellent. Perfect, yeah. Your, your, your feedback is uh, very much appreciated. Excellent. <laughs> very good, thank you. Um, all right, so moving on. So uh, the payer subgroup is he headed up by uh, Ravish. Ravish, you want to give us an update on uh, the work that the payer subgroup is doing? Yeah, um, Rich, thank you very much. And um, yes, we, we have started with our meetings for this year. Uh, last week, we had our first meeting for 2020. And our goal was to kind of nail down uh, the scope for going forward, um, or at least things that we want to accomplish in 2020. Uh, again, I, I have an open invitation for any of these group members to join our subgroup. Um, we have uh, kind of nailed down at least one use case that we all uh, want to get started on from a uh, prescription management standpoint. Uh, if you if you look at the industry today, uh, you usually go to the doctor and you you know get a prescription, prescri prescription gets sent to a location of your choice. And then, you know, if you have to be fluid in, you know, getting your prescription filled, it just takes another step to go back to the doctor, get the, re, uh, you know, uh, get it resent to another location and all. So what we are thinking of is, you know, kind of looking at a framework that can help manage that information such that, um, you know, the right parties are, are in the, um, you know, in the flow. And at the same time, there is a real time consent management from the, from the member to be able to, you know, um, you know, a, a physician sending out a prescription and who is retrieving that prescription is being managed by the member as, you know, they visit a location um, uh, and, you know, kind of with the real time consent, which actually, you know, drove us to a conversation, um, you know, with Kent on, um, you know, their group is, has done some work on e-consent and that's something that we are kind of collaborating uh, in our next meeting to hear from them, um, Kent and Dennis, um, you know, uh, group on, um, you know, what they're doing on e and see how we can, you know, use that uh, or apply that to the overall, you know, use case that we are working on. So that's where we are. Uh, we have, um, you know, one of the pairs uh, that expressed interest last year. Uh, you know, we, we just wanted to kind of reorganize our group and then go back to them and see how they can, uh, you know, help with some uh, resources to start the overall, um, you know, um, I would say POC or kind of a, um, a use case creation um, and, and kind of do some kind of a validation from industry standpoint on, yeah, and I'm sure while we are doing that, we'll uncover some of the other things that come in our way um, and it'll take that shape. So that's where we are right now. Um, again, I, I encourage everyone to, you know, see if they I have interest in from payer standpoint. Um, see if you can if you can join the meeting and add value. I'm sure um, anyone on the group can add value. And if there is anything that you think uh, should be added to the agenda for uh, going forward from payer uh, standpoint, please do bring it to our notice, and we'll see what we can do to incorporate that in the plan. Thank you, Ravish. And and uh, as just as a reminder, uh, how often do you meet, and when do you meet? Yeah, we have uh, moved our meetings to every other Friday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time um, uh, Rick, to uh, accommodate. Uh, I think there was some confusion going on from the previous meetings on when do we meet. So we just kind of realigned that. We might have to have another, you know, kind of readjustment of time based on, um, you know, making sure all the members who are active and are joining regularly. Um, just, just want to make sure that the time is convenient. But as of now, we meet every other Friday 
uh, we have our next meeting uh, next Friday at uh, 1 p.m. Excellent. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, and and that is that is uh, immediately after uh, the patient member subgroup uh, meeting, correct? Yeah, I think there is a, there is a, uh, it has been updated in the uh, hyperledger calendar. And I do know there is another meeting just before that meeting as well. Right. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that's that's Dennis's meeting uh, for the patient member subgroup, and then I I believe then then you're the next hour after that. So that would be great yep. uh, for us to sort of yep. have that aligned uh, in a convenient way for people to to just sort of keep in the in their minds that the week opposite of this general meeting week is when uh, two two of our three uh, subgroups meet, and then of course our healthcare interoperability subgroup uh, meets uh, on on the, the preceding Monday. Uh, so, um, so thank you for that, Devi, uh, Ravish. Appreciate it. Uh, and then, speaking of the healthcare and operating subgroup, uh, Stephen Elliott uh, leads that. Uh, I don't see Stephen on the call. Uh, is there anyone on the uh, on the on that team uh, who'd like to speak on Stephen's behalf? So. Um, so what I what I know from Stephen is, uh, of course, we had uh, uh, our, our guest earlier on the call, Guillermo from Mexico. He was uh, he gave a great presentation about some of the work that they're doing uh, there. Uh, that presentation was made uh, to the uh, the HIS, uh, that Stephen's uh, subgroup, uh, and uh, it's always great to to get presentations uh, generated. That presentation is available for anyone that who's interested uh, to sort of follow up on it, and I highly recommend you sort of listen into it. Uh, through our uh, through the wiki here, uh, and it's all recorded. Uh, and again, I'll, obviously, all of our subgroups are recorded as well for the same reason. Uh, so I, I encourage you to sort of do uh, take some time to to check out that presentation. Uh, I know Stephen going forward is uh, is developing a, a very uh, mature uh, 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 project plan. And, uh, and again, as, as I think we talked about a little bit earlier, his interest is uh, developing uh, a, a semantic interoperability solution, uh, which uh, as we know, interoperability is a big issue um, uh, in, the, in, in the healthcare space. Uh, and then specifically as it relates to, um, you know, trying to integrate blockchain solutions into sort of legacy systems within healthcare. And of course, it seems like just about everything is a legacy system these days. Uh, so it's a very interesting space uh, to, to be in. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to sit in on one of Stephen's uh, subgroup meetings, uh, it would be a great opportunity for you to, to do so if you're interested in uh, interoperability. Okay, so moving on to our ad hoc teams. Uh, I, I always have sort of this question out to anyone who's a Confluence expert. I think Jim had sort of volunteered uh, some of his expertise. What we're really looking for is sort of uh, someone who has sort of a big picture view on how uh, we might sort of take uh, not just this SIG, not, to, not just this SIG, but maybe all SIGs and try to find a, a common sort of fit theme uh, across all of them. And our interest, uh, and this is a, at a much broader level, is to find a way to make it much easier for, uh, for members uh, or, or uh, future members, someone new to the organization uh, to sort of come here, get a good sense for what's available to them and to, th then uh, to be able to move back and forth between special interest, interest groups to, to find an appropriate fit. Uh, and so I always sort of keep this, uh, we have a sort of this ad hoc uh, redesign team that's, uh, that, that we sort of keep spun up for addressing these sorts of issues as they, uh, as they come up and, and so, um, I just always want to keep it open to anyone who who's interested in in participating and uh, sort of thinking big picture on on a redesign uh, or or tweaks to existing design uh, within our SIGs proper and our HC SIG uh, specifically. Rich, I'll make a comment. Now, at least sure. the nice thing about the way you've set it up is that we have the healthcare SIG, but then the the um, the subgroups are all, in a sense, children of the parent page, which is nice. You know what I mean? So I go to your, right. on, the, on the project list, I go to healthcare, and once I open up healthcare, I can easily see the three subgroups there for what it's worth. I, I don't know, other than search and maybe some tags, what else you would do to make the subgroups visible. You know what I mean? But the, the way yeah. you have them organized is nice. 
Oh, okay. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for the feedback. Uh, yeah, and so um, uh, and, and the, the healthcare team, uh, our, our SIG here really is uh, one of the first uh, early, early groups here. Uh, and so we had a lot of uh, sort of uh, flexibility in how we wanted to do things. I think we were the first to do subgroups proper. So uh, it's good to know that that seems to be working uh, very well. And uh, the mechanism from my pers perspective is very good because these general meetings are really intended for roll up uh, in the same way that if anyone is involved in board activity, you have you know committees and those committees roll up to uh, usually an executive committee that then rolls up to a full board. And so this is a very, very similar mechanism. Okay, uh, so Erica, do you wanna give us sort of a status on our use case development team? Sure, thank you, Rich. Um, before I give the update, update, I just wanted to make a comment to the pair subgroup um, with Ravish. Um, if you need any help with like the mechanics of prescription processing, um, I have a background as a pharmacist and I think there's another pharmacist um, who calls in occasionally. Um, so I can try and call into the next meeting or if you, um, you know, if you want any perspective from that level, um, go ahead and let me know or send me the invite and, or I'll try to find the invite for the meeting. I do think I have another meeting at that time, so I, I'm not sure it'll work, but um, I'll try to call in. Okay, so the, the use case subgroup, um, we have four use cases. I've reached out to the people who have um, kind of expressed interest and set up a meeting for February 18th. I'm still waiting to get confirmation um, from some people on attending that meeting. Um, we're really flexible on, I think it's on a Tuesday, and I'm kind of just randomly picking a time, so I'm sort of working around everyone's schedule to try to figure it out. Um, but I, I, like all the other subgroups, I welcome anyone who's interested in um, any of the use cases, which are medical records, payer, credentialing, and supply chain. Um, I have a background as a literature analyst, and so I really want to make these um, evidence-based and kind of go out into the into the current literature and see um, who's been using Hyperledger for different pilots or proof of concepts and sort of basing these use cases off of what people are doing, not only out in the literature, but in the subgroups um, and within our group and other standards organizations. Um, I also have access to a very large library of blockchain and healthcare um, articles that was put together by uh, my very good friend, Wendy Charles, um, so I can help with gathering evidence for the use cases to write them up. Um, so, and I also, I'm a review editor for Frontiers in Blockchain Science and an ambassador for Blockchain Healthcare Today, so I have a lot of access to literature, and I'd really like to make these use cases um, compelling and quality uh, so that we can use them to present to, you know, other companies or interested stakeholders in healthcare. So if you have any interest in helping us out, we do, we probably are going to need more people um, to help write these. Uh, and you don't have to have, you know, I know a lot of you have a technical background, but these are going to be more high level and get into a little bit more depth with which Hyperledger solutions are being used. Um, so if you have any interest, please let me know. Excellent. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, and, and this, this, uh, this team really came about as a result of last year's uh, feedback from, uh, from the HIMSS conference. And so, yeah, this, this is very important going forward. Uh, and so uh, I, I imagine there's going to be some really great value as we push these back out into the uh, into the healthcare community to help uh, help advise folks on on how best to make use of blockchain technologies. So so thank you for that, Erica. Okay, uh, well we we just have a few minutes left, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, our membership survey. Uh, this is uh, we do this every year. This is an annual event. Um, and so uh, I want to make sure that we get everybody involved in this. We have about a thousand members involved in this uh, special interest group. So we want to try to get as many people to, to be representative of those thousand members. Uh, so the, the survey itself is through Google Forms. It should be fairly straightforward. Uh, I have a link uh, here uh, for you to, to, to use if you haven't already taken the survey. So who, has, has anyone on the call not taken the survey yet? Would you admit that you didn't? <laughs> so if you haven't, please do. This is really important because uh, really this, this helps us, uh, helps Erica and myself sort of set direction for, uh, for this uh, special interest group. And, uh, and the feedback that we get uh, really helps to dial in on where our focus needs to be. And we, you know, it, it, we ask an, an awful lot of interesting questions about uh, some, some fundamental things about you know, your experience 
uh, using blockchain, uh, the types of blockchain uh, frameworks uh, and products that you're using in that space. Uh, and so it really helps us, uh, helps inform us on how do we move forward. Uh, and our deadline uh, is uh, for the survey is next week, Friday. So we have about a week to go. Uh, and again, like I said, uh, if you haven't taken the survey, please do so. It's, it's a pretty straightforward survey. It, it, it'll take, I don't know, maybe three minutes, five minutes to do. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So I, I highly recommend that, that you participate in this. Uh, I suspect uh, sometime midweek next week, I'll send out a, a final reminder for folks uh, to, to the, the whole of membership just to make sure that we get that taken care of. Okay, so uh, so really a couple, a couple of remaining things. I always uh, post out here a couple of links for anyone who's interested in getting involved in uh, a sort of government, uh, sort of subsidized uh, uh, blockchain, uh, potential blockchain opportunities. Uh, for those of us that are in the small business world, these are called uh, SIBRs or SITRs. Uh, a SITR, uh, SIBR is, is more small business oriented where a, a SITR or SDTR is small business uh, wedded to academia. Uh, and then uh, we also have grants that are managed through the uh, NIH, National Institute of Health. Uh, those are links that I just keep there uh, so that uh, anyone's interested in sort of driving uh, solutions and looking for sort of funding efforts, uh, funding opportunities that all happens through here, as well at an, at an international level. Uh, if you are a qualifying small business, uh, UNICEF uh, offers what's called an innovation fund, and that could go to a blockchain solution as well. So with the, with the last few minute, minutes remaining, uh, any comments or questions uh, before we close out for, uh, for today's meeting? Hey, Rich, it's Erica. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, next weekend, or the weekend of the 14th, there's a big um, blockchain conference here in Denver called East Denver. Um, it's not really focused on healthcare, but this year is the first year that I've been told and asked to sort of participate in the healthcare movement. Um, but yeah, it's a big hackathon, um, and actually Vitalik Buterin is going to be there, the uh, founder of Ethereum. Um, it's a huge event, so I'm, I will be in attendance, and I'll, um, I can see if there's any hyperledger presence there. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, you know, and if you want, Erica, uh, feel free to post it up to the, uh, to the uh, HCSIC listserv uh, if you think it's appropriate. Uh, I, suspect, uh, I, I suspect some aspects of healthcare may be represented at the conference, so it may be valuable uh, to some folks. And it's always good to get a kind of a general sense for the, sort of the overall quality uh, and, and maybe gravitas for, for conferences in general so that we can get them on our co sort of collective schedules uh, as, as we sort of learn more about them. So thank you for that. Sure, sounds good. All righty, any other comments or thoughts Are before? We... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th this is Guillermo speaking. Sorry, I have to switch because I'm driving to a meeting, but uh, a quick question for you or, or for the team. Is there any educational, uh, educational courses online or, or some documentations that we can, you know, use inside this uh, uh, specific for, for uh, healthcare or, or I have to search into the web just to find out uh, if there is something around. I'm oh, that's, sure yeah. Is, there is some specific. So, so that's a great question, Guillermo. So, uh, offhand, I would uh, I would say uh, we have a resources section. There may be some value uh, here, um, and I would I would recommend that you just sort of take a look and sort of walk through that first. Um, as far as uh, educational information uh, regarding uh, blockchain in healthcare, uh, I don't know offhand. It's not something that we do internally through Hyperledger. Uh, I, I do know that uh, Hyperledger through the Linux Foundation uh, does do training for, uh, for their frameworks, but that is not really healthcare related. So uh, I'll open that up. Erica, any thoughts uh, on, on good resources? Yeah, there's, there's a lot out there and you have to be careful because some of it's not so great. Um, I can post them up there, some of the more reputable ones, um, if you like. There is, there is a general course in the Linux Foundation and they go through use cases that include healthcare, but it's not specific right. to healthcare. Right. Um, but there definitely are some out there that are specific to healthcare. Um, and, you know, there's some bad ones out there too. So. <laughs> 
you know, uh, what, so, so in addition to what Erica would, would pass along, I would recommend Guillermo, uh, feel free also to use listserv for this, because I think this is a great question. Uh, and again, we have a thousand members in membership, so uh, it would be great if you uh, use listserv, generate an email, ask that question. And honestly, it's a good question, and I just don't know, uh, you know, I can't give you a great answer, but I'm sure someone out of our a thousand folks uh, would, would have some very good pointers to, to push you to. So that would be a, a great question to ask. Um, I'll, I'll throw in that if okay. you're looking on the technical side, not the use case side, but more just the technical side, on Fabric, for instance, um, the Fabric documentation team has done a great job of not just documenting what Fabric is and how to use it, but they've got some pretty good tutorials out there now, and they've got some more that are coming on the deployment side. Um, yeah, 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 they, yeah, they're very, very good uh, with their documentation. Absolutely, I totally agree, Jim. Okay, uh, well, thanks everybody. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your day, and have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Rich.